The next topic we're going to be talking about to finish off our series of acid-based disorders is respiratory alkalosis. How do we define it? What is respiratory alkalosis? This is an increase in blood what? pH is alkaline guys. We've talked about this. If you don't understand, it's the first time you're watching this video, always go back. We've made videos on introduction so you're not missing much. It's very important. So there's an increase in blood pH. Can't you, don't you guys just love this formula? You become a superstar the day you memorize this formula. But it's not much I can do if you don't. Something is wrong. A pH is what? It's really high in the blood. And it's due to what? Because it's respiratory, so we're going to stay below the formula again. That means what? The, if your pH is going up on the top, the only way is this could be happening if you're in respiratory, alkalosis, alkaline means a lot of pH, right? pH greater than what? 7.45, right? That means PCO2 is low. You know what? I think this is actually one of the easiest because what causes people to what? To go into respiratory alkalosis. The major cause is hyperventilation. So what do I mean by that? That means your PCO2 should be less than 40. What do we mean by that? If your PSCO2 has to be less than 40, what do I have to do? I have to breathe really fast. <sighs> right? When I do that, what happens to my pH? It starts to go up. That's a respiratory alkalosis. That's it. That's pretty easy, guys. It doesn't get easier than that. But there's so always a little small little thing you got to memorize. Since you guys are pros at this now, you should be telling me the answer to this. If at the bottom, we are undergoing respiratory alkalosis and our P, uh, PaCO2 is dropping because we're blowing it so fast out of the lungs, right? It's coming out so fast, the only way we're going to fix it is what? Metabolically, right? Because now in this case, my pH is low. I'm sorry, apologize for that. It's high because, my, I mean, my blood pH is very high. Because down here, my PaCO2 is so low because I'm hyperventilating. The only way, the only way I can fix this is to bring this pH down is by doing what? Decrease my bicarb, decrease my bicarb, decrease my bicarb. How do I do that? Remember, if the lung is where the primary problem is, the only person that's available in the entire world to help you is the kidney. So the kidney says, I got your back. I got your back. I'm going to start doing what? Excreting out all the bicarb out of my system. What are you going to do? You're going to be peeing your brains out, right? You pee out the bicarb so that if I pee it out through the kidneys, that's the only way I can get it out, right? We lose bicarb, bicarb excretion. That's how we're going to fix it. So metabolically, if I keep peeing this out and my bicarb is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing, it's less than 24, what will happen to my pH? My pH will start to drop down slowly because that's how the body compensates. It's all compensations. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. That's it. So now, let's talk about how the kidneys acutely and chronically compensate. Right? Remember the kidney is slow. What do you expect? The guy sitting back retroperitoneal just having a good time with a bottle of wine. No, it's just, you know, it's working very hard. So in an acute situation, for each 10 millimeter decrease in your PSCO2, right? Which means for every, this is acute by the way. So I should have actually erased this because the next thing we're talking about right now is compensation, right? Because acutely and chronically, by the kidneys, by the way, little kidneys, smiley face, right? Acute for every 10 
millimeters of mercury decrease in PaCO2, which is the primary problem, right? We're breathing out too fast, so we're blowing out all the CO2. What do you think is gonna happen to our pH? Our bicarb actually decreases by two milli moles per liter. Actually, two, you can use two milli equivalents per liter of bicarb is lost. Shall we do a problem? No, nope, not yet. Because then this will increase our pH of our blood by 0 0.08 milli equivalent per liter. I like to do problems so we can kind of put this in perspective. There's a bunch of numbers. Basically, what we are saying is this. Um, let me erase this so we can see where we are. Let's erase this so we can see where we are. This is pH, right? Let's start from the bottom. From, for every 10 millimeter decrease in PaCO2, so let's take, a, let's take a, a problem here and pick a bunch of numbers, right? In the corner here. Before the kidney compensate, the PaCO2 was 30. You're already hyperventilated at this point. You're already blowing it out. The PaCO2 is already dropped. And the only way, so let's say this is 30, right? The only way to fix it, and we know the pH is going to drop anyway. And the pH, let's say the pH, let's pick a good number, 7.2. Okay? Just for the sake of it. Bicarb, which has to be peed out. Remember, the kidney has to compensate. The bicarb was a... Uh, it's a 24 at this point, actually. So if we were to do the math for every 10, so if PSCO2 goes up, uh, goes down by 10, and now you're down to 20, that's a lot, right? You drop in this area. On the, that's where the problem is. That's the primary problem. The only way to fix is to come up here. Bicarb would drop by 2, which means 24 minus 2 would be what? 22. This drop and bicarb will help you bring your pH back up slowly by 0 0.08. Do you guys get it? That means our pH will be increasing by 0 .0, uh, 0 0.08, right? That means we're going to have 7.28 increase in pH. Do you guys see that? We're getting closer, closer to 7.35. That's basically what the math is, all right? So now we've known how the kidney compensates acutely. How about chronically? Not much is really changing much. The only difference, remember, chronic is always going to be higher. What you should expect in the chronic situation. So we've done with acute. I would expect this number to be what? Higher. Actually, 5 to 6. And this is actually 0 0.02. So, if we do the math, for, if this is a chronic condition, right, somebody, somebody has a lot of COPD for so long, right, and they're always hyperventilating every time they go into what? I'm sorry. We didn't even talk, or we haven't even talked about the causes yet, so we're going to talk about it in a minute. But for chronic, uh, cr chronic compensation, right, and COPD patients can get respiratory alkalosis, but that would be like if they, go, if they have sepsis or some kind of problem like that. So for every 10, again, which we be, they'll be down to 20. Now they, the bicarb, they're losing a lot of bicarb at this point. There's some serious thing going on. So the bicarb will be going down by what? Five or six. So if you subtract, uh, let's say six, from that would be 18. Look at that. You're losing a lot of bicarb. Your bicarb drops. And how what will happen to your PaCO2? We add that, 0.02, and that will give us 7.2. Two, two. So this is, this is just formulas that are extra information I'm teaching you guys. This is probably what you know people that do a lot of respiratory uh, uh, therapy calculate to make sure everything is going on. Computer probably crunches out the numbers, but it's always good for me to be complete, right? All right, great. Now that we're done with that, let's talk about what causes.
respiratory alkalosis. You've seen this a million times. Trust me, it's probably happened to you before. How about this? Have you ever seen somebody nervous before? People that have anxiety. They don't look nice and cool, right? They're not chilling by the hallway like, hey, no. <sighs> They're freaking out. Oh my God, they filled an exam. Oh my God, somebody died. Oh my goodness, something is bad is gonna happen. They start to hyperventilate. They go into respiratory alkalosis. The next time you see somebody like panicking, freaking out, you know, they're what? They're hyperventilating. How about this? This is very common. People that have tachypnea, pulmonary embolism, very common. Their heart is racing so fast, they're breathing really fast because there's a clot in their lungs. So that's actually another cause. How about this? Sepsis. How does sepsis cause you to go into respiratory alkalosis? That's a good point. Sepsis, right, which is what? Infection in the blood. You already got a bacteria sitting in there. You go into systemic vasodilatation. You start off having metabolic acidosis. Right? However, how do we compensate for metabolic acidosis? We hyperventilate. If we do it for long enough, hyperventilate. If we hyperventilate long enough, what we will develop? Respiratory alkalosis. Does that make sense? Right? The next thing is also mechanical ventilation. If you put on a, if a ventilator is breathing too fast for you and it's blowing too much CO2 out, basically anything that can help you get CO2 out of your body faster basically causes hyperventilation. Right? Another thing that I think is a high yield information you guys should know about this is what? Aspirin toxicity, salicylate, salicylate. Let me make sure I'm salicylate, right? Salicylate, right? Aspirin, notoriously known for causing lactic acidosis. Remember the mud piles? Yeah, I know. Everything always comes back and bites you in the butt. What happens? They go into a respiratory, they go into metabolic acidosis for with an ion gap. Then they hyperventilate so much they develop a what? A respiratory alkalosis. Pregnant women they have a lot of progesterone in their body. They hyperventilate, right? So you want to know that. So what are they gonna come with signs and symptoms of these patients? Let's talk about that for a minute. Symptoms, right? Since these patients are <coughs> hyperventilating, right? Which is when we said if they're hypoventilating initially for respiratory acidosis, if you breathe out too fast, you decrease what? CO2 means decrease cerebral perfusion, right? To your brain. That's not cool, right? That will cause vasoconstriction, right? If you see all the blood vessels in your brain is constricting, guess what? You're gonna be lightheaded. You're gonna feel dizzy. All of a sudden, you get lightheaded. You get dizzy. Right? These patients, they start to get tingling and numbness. They also get tetanine, right? Tingling, paresthesia, basically. Paresthesia. Okay? And it can also develop arrhythmia. So this is bad, right? You see people hyperventilating too much. You gotta fix what the problem is. That's the only way we treat it. You find the underlying cause, right? If they have a pulmonary embolism, you give, make sure you pick it up on CAT scan. If you have to do a, a, a CT angel, to be able to see, to make sure they don't have a clot in their lungs, that you're gonna have to give heparin, right? And eventually give them warfarin, so you treat that. Um, if they're very nervous and they have anxiety, you give them a uh, benzodiazepine, right? You give them Ativan, you calm them down with uh, uh, Ativan, which is a, probably, you could give them lorazepam, <sighs> they calm down, all right? If they go into sepsis, you're gonna have to treat that. We're gonna talk about sepsis uh, soon in a different lecture, 
but you're going to have to fix that because their heart is getting strained. You start to pump blood against this external uh, visibility in their body. And that's why their heart races so fast because they can't keep up. So you want to fix that, right? If they're pregnant, there's not much we can do about that. All right? Okay? If they take aspirin, you're going to have to give them bicarbonate, right? You give them sodium bicarbonate because aspirin is salicylic acid. So if I have an acid in my body, hmm, let me see how I get rid of it. I'll use a base. Yeah, how about that? We put bicarb. Bicarb allows them to alkalinize their urine and get rid of the what? The aspirin. If it's too much aspirin in their body, you have to put them on dialysis. So you fix it that way. Basically, you fix the underlying cause. Um, also, you can call, talk, tell them to breathe in the brown. Oh, it's a brown paper bag that can also help so that they can inhale back some of the CO2. That's a good idea. Actually, that often happens to a lot of people. Okay? All right. In pregnancy, there's not much you're going to do. So now, basically, that's the end of our lecture. You guys are now master planners. You guys become gods of acid base. The mysterious, most difficult concept in medical school, pharmacy school, nursing school. Jeez, I never knew it could be this easy. Yes, it can. You just need somebody to tell you exactly what's going on. All right? I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And that is the end of respiratory alkalosis. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support us by clicking on the ads below. We will surely appreciate that. And you can go to our website, www.ftpinc.org, or check out my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash T-O-M-I-W-A-007. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.